it's your girl Asha and I am back back with another video and today I'm going to be watching Napoleon's Masterpiece Austerlitz 1805 by Epic History TV. I think I said that right, Austerlitz? I think so. You guys wanted me to do this series so here I am going to be learning about Napoleon and I'm just having so much fun relearning and learning about history. If you guys would like to join my history discord the link will be down below and if you guys haven't subscribed already what are you waiting for hit the red button so you can be a part of the family don't forget to give your girl a thumbs up enough of me talk and let's get straight into this reaction an epic history tv history march collaboration supported by our sponsor the great courses plus in december 1804 in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor of the French. Europe had never seen such a sudden and dramatic rise to power. A son of impoverished Corsican nobility to military dictator of France in little more than 10 years. Revolution and war had cleared Napoleon's path to the throne. War would dominate his 10-year reign. A conflict unprecedented in history that would leave millions dead and a continent in turmoil. Wow. Part one. Eight months after Napoleon's coronation, the French Empire and its Spanish ally were at war with Britain. And Napoleon had assembled an army of 180,000 men along wow. the Channel coast. That's a lot. But as long as the British Royal Navy ruled the seas, invasion was impossible. So the British um, ruled the sea because they had more ships, more gunpowder. Is that the reason why they ruled the sea? They were just more equipped than Napoleon in his army? Comment down below and let me know. But nor could Britain challenge France on land. Mm. And so British Prime Minister William Pitt tried to build a European coalition against they Napoleon Bonnie, using Bonnie diplomacy Bonnie? and gold. Britain would prove Napoleon's most steadfast enemy and its press delighted in relentless mockery of the French Emperor. Britain and France were old rivals in Europe and overseas. But now, Pitt feared Napoleon's conquests had made France too powerful. The French Emperor had to be defeated. And Europe's balance of power restored if there was ever to be lasting peace. Pitt found willing allies in Europe among monarchs who despised Napoleon as a product of the French Revolution Dang. and a dangerous threat to the existing order. They didn't like him. Austria harbored the deepest grievances, having seen her influence in Germany and Italy steadily eroded by French victories. I have another question. Is Austerlitz part of Austria? Comment down below and let me know. The final straw came in May 1804, when Napoleon had also crowned himself King of Italy in yeah. Milan. Austria, Russia, Sweden and Naples joined Britain in an alliance known as the Third Coalition and devised an ambitious plan for a series of joint offensives against France. The main attack would be made by a combined Austro-Russian army advancing across the Rhine into France. But Napoleon got word of their plans and reacted wow. with typical speed and decision. How did he get word? He was determined to strike first before the Allies could join forces and ordered his army, now renamed La Grande Armée, to march to the River Rhine. It seems like whoever moves in first usually has the upper hand when it comes to like uh fighting in the war that's what it seems like his target was the austrian army of general mack which had made a premature advance against bavaria a french ally 
and was now dangerously isolated from the other Allied armies. Napoleon ordered Marshal Murat, his famously flamboyant cavalry commander, to make faint attacks through the Black Forest, while the rest of his army, advancing at speed, enveloped Mack's army from the north. That summer, Napoleon's Grande Armée was at its most formidable. Well-trained, highly motivated, its regiments at full strength. What's more, it had been newly reorganized according to the Corps system, later imitated by virtually every army in the world. Each corps, commanded by a marshal, was a mini-army of 15 to 30,000 soldiers, wow. with its own infantry, cavalry, artillery, and supporting arms, such as... Re I have another question. Um, I've seen that there is a series about, about the the marshals does this have anything to do with it connaissance engineers and transport this meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time independently uh... allowing napoleon to break with the old doctrine of keeping his army concentrated and advance with his corps widely dispersed oh he has them split up this helped to disguise his real objective and increased movement speed because the army could advance along multiple roads and live off the land, taking its supplies from scattered villages. That's a dope strategy. On slow moving supply wagons. When the enemy's main force was located, the army could quickly concentrate for battle. This is how Napoleon's army was able to move at a speed that often surprised and disorientated oh, wow. his enemies. So basically, confuse them. Mac didn't realize the danger he was in until it was too late. Napoleon's fast-moving corps crossed the Danube behind him and surrounded his army. Mac launched a series of poorly coordinated counterattacks, but despite some desperate fighting, the Austrians couldn't break out of the trap. Mack hoped that Kutuzov's Russian army could arrive in time to save him. But the Russians were still 160 miles away. Damn, that's a long and time. And so, at Ulm, on the 19th of October, just six weeks into the war, Mack surrendered his army to Napoleon. Damn. They the French like... took nearly 60,000 Austrian prisoners. A hundred, he said like 150-something miles? They probably took like months to probably get there. That's a long ass time. I couldn't imagine like walking a hundred and something miles. Well, no, they didn't walk. They had like horses. They didn't have cars. Dang. Yeah, that's a long ass. That's a long ass time to get somewhere. Cause I'm thinking like when I'm traveling somewhere and it's a hundred and something miles. That's like maybe a couple of hours. So I only could imagine how many days, weeks, probably a month or two or three it took for them to get there. And Napoleon had struck his first devastating blow against the coalition. Russian General Mikhail Kutuzov was an experienced and wary commander, more cautious than Mack. His army was exhausted after its 900-mile march from uh, Russia. Duh. But hearing of the Austrians' surrender at Ulm, and knowing he wasn't strong enough to face Napoleon alone, he immediately ordered a retreat. <laughs> Napoleon pursued. <laughs> the Russians fought several sharp rearguard actions, but could not save the Austrian capital, Vienna, which the French occupied on the 12th of October. Kutuzov slipped away to Olmutz in today's Czech Republic, where he was joined by reinforcements, as well as Emperor Alexander of Russia and Emperor Francis of Austria in person. Napoleon was furious that Kutuzov had escaped. By now, his army was also exhausted, and far from home, 
with winter approaching. Ooh, the you need to winter. force a decisive battle quickly. Fortunately for him, the overconfident 27-year-old Russian emperor sought the glory of battle, overriding the concerns of his veteran commander, General Kutuzov. With the Allied army closing in, Napoleon ordered his corps to rapidly concentrate on a battlefield he had carefully selected, near the town of Austerlitz. Napoleon oversaw the dispositions of his army late into the night, then grabbed a few hours sleep beside a campfire. Dawn would mark the first anniversary of his coronation as emperor, and promised a battle that would make or break his young empire. The morning of the 2nd of December, 1805, was cold and bright with a heavy mist. Two armies of near equal size faced each other across a seven mile wide battlefield. But the Allies held the high ground of the Pratzen Heights, while French Third Corps under Marshal Davout was still marching to the battlefield. Seeing Napoleon's thinly stretched right flank, the Allies planned a large-scale attack from the Pratzen Heights to steamroller the French right before swinging round to envelop Napoleon's army. Oh, wow. Little did they know, Napoleon was counting on his weak right wing luring the Allies into just such a move, whereupon he would launch his own attack on the Pratzen Heights to cut the Allied army in half. His bold plan relied on his correct prediction of Allied movements, the speedy arrival of Davout's Third Corps on his right, and a perfectly timed counterattack. The battle began around 7 a.m. as Austrian troops of General Keinmeyer's advance guard clashed with French troops defending the village of Telnitz. face of overwhelming odds, the French fought stubbornly and bravely, but gradually they were forced back. But the Allies, instead of carrying out their great enveloping attack, did nothing. The what? morning mist and the late arrival of orders had led to confusion and delay, and it was another hour before the first three Allied columns were on the move. Soon, fierce fighting erupted around Sokolnitz's village and castle. Marshal Davout's corps, which had just force-marched 70 miles in two days, now arrived to strengthen the French right wing. Around 9 a.m., his lead infantry brigade appeared suddenly through the mist and retook Telnitz, before being driven back in turn by Austrian hussars. So Two more of Davout's right. brigades reinforced French troops at Sokolnitz. As the mist began to clear, Napoleon saw that, as he'd hoped, he the, the Allied now. left was moving off the Pratzen Heights. And he ordered Marshal Soult's 4th Corps to begin its attack. To the alarm of Allied commanders, two French infantry divisions, until now hidden by the mist, were suddenly seen advancing straight wow. towards the Allied center. General Kutuzov was forced to hurriedly organize a defense of the heights using troops of four column. Two hours of bloody fighting followed. Yeah. Musket fire was so rapid and furious that both sides were soon low on ammunition and turned to the bayonet. Wow. By 11 a.m., the French, with the advantage in training and discipline, had secured the heights and driven a deep wedge into the Allied position. Look at them, they moving in, boy. To the north, a giant cavalry battle developed. While a Russian force from General Bagration's oh, advance guard captured the village of Bosenitz before it was halted by cannon fire from the Santon Hill. Oh, okay, the French. 
a decisive charge by six regiments of French heavy cavalry, finally drove back the Allies, allowing Marshal Lannes' five corps to move forward and seize Blasowitz and Krug. Now, Grand Duke Constantine, commanding the Russian Imperial Guard, led forward this last Allied reserve in a desperate bid to reclaim the Pratzen Heights. A battalion of the French 4th Line Regiment was charged down by Russian Guard cavalry, losing its eagle standard in bloody fighting. Napoleon, who'd moved up to the heights, sent in his own guard cavalry. In this grim melee between the elite horsemen of both armies, the French finally prevailed. Napoleon had broken the Allied center. Now, to close the trap on the Allied left wing, still locked in heavy fighting around Sokolnitz. Oh, he's back in the mud. Around 2 p.m., Napoleon ordered four divisions to swing south and cut off their retreat. General Buxhauden, commanding the Allied left, only now saw the danger he was in. Attacked from three sides, the only escape was south. Many of his troops were forced to flee across frozen ponds. French artillery opened fire trying to smash the ice with their cannonballs. About 200 men and dozens of horses drowned in the freezing water. Oh. But not the many thousands of Napoleon's propaganda. Mm. That's messed up. The French emperor had won a brilliant victory. His army had taken more than 10,000 prisoners and captured 45 enemy standards. Thousands of dead and wounded of all sides littered the battlefield. Many left untended for days. Wow. So there was more deaths on the The Battle of the side. Three Emperors, as it became known, was a crushing blow to the Third Coalition. As Russian forces retreated back to Russia, Francis I of Austria was forced to accept a humiliating settlement with France agreeing to pay a 40 million franc indemnity and give up more territory in exchange for peace. Mm. But meanwhile, news had reached Napoleon of a disastrous Franco-Spanish defeat at sea off Cape Trafalgar. British Admiral Lord Nelson, at the cost of his own life, had masterminded a victory so complete that it ensured British naval dominance not just for the rest of the war, but for the next 100 years. Britain, master of the sea. Napoleon, unbeatable on land. The whale and the elephant, neither able to challenge the other in its own domain. When William Pitt received news of Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz, he's supposed to have said, roll up that map of Europe. It will not be wanted these ten years. Yeah. A month later, Pitt was dead. But his warning that Europe faced another ten years of war and upheaval was, right. was to prove prophetic. Napoleon Bonaparte was the ultimate disruptor of European history. One man who transformed a continent. If you want to find out more, why not try a free trial with The Great Courses Plus, a fantastic on-demand video subscription service featuring more than 70 history courses, all taught by top academics. I like um, Napoleon's um, Bonaparte strategy when it comes to, like, military and, like, battling. Um, he has very good defense, I'm going to say. I definitely, definitely enjoy it i don't know it just seems i don't know that he was just like so smart kind of like alexander the great too um yeah so comment down below let me know what you guys think give your girl a thumbs up and i'll see you guys in the next video bye fam